critical perspectives on the news is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good morning and welcome to Ethical Perspectives on the News. My name is Alan Deal. I currently serve on the Interreligious Council of Lynn County and also am the Vice President of the Humanists of Lynn County. Uh, on this morning's show, uh, we'll be discussing the future of work. Specifically, we're going to look at how robotics and artificial intelligence are impacting the workforce today and on into the future. Um, now in preparation for today's show, I actually purchased and read this book by Max Tegmark. He is a professor of cosmology at uh, MIT. Uh, it's quite an interesting read. Uh, it really helps you take a deeper dive into this issue of artificial intelligence, how it's impacting the world, um, and ultimately how it's going to transform our lives. And uh, so if, you, if you're interested, uh, I certainly uh, recommend it. Um, and he discusses a lot more uh, about the subject than we'll talk about today. Now, speaking of discussing, uh, we, I have with me today three uh, distinguished panelists uh, to help us dive into this topic. And uh, I, I wonder if you could just have each one of you just take about 30 seconds and just introduce yourself, uh, tell us what you do, and uh, why this uh, subject interests you. All right, well, I'll get started. Good morning, Alan, and uh, good morning, Rick and, and Brett. Um, my name is Juan Pablo Rucat. I'm a professor in computer science at the University of Iowa. Uh, there, I focus my research in human-computer interaction, so I look at all the human factors associated with technology, so that's the reason why this topic interests me. Excellent. Uh, good morning. Uh, Rick Boyle, I'm executive director of the Hawkeye Area Labor Council here in Cedar Rapids, and uh, we are a coalition of unions. Um, we strive for economic and social justice and uh, uh, legislative action that would help promote the overall good of working people, uh, not only in Iowa, but the entire country. We have uh, uh, around uh, uh, 75 affiliates here in the state of Iowa, and we are a branch of the AFL-CIO uh, covering Northeast Iowa. I'm uh, Brett Trout. I'm a patent lawyer. I've been a patent lawyer for about 25 years. I've written several books on internet law, including cyber law. Uh, this interests me because I just think having an idea of where things are going allows you to prepare better, uh, and I just find it fascinating. Well, thank you. And uh, certainly each one of you, I think, kind of brings to the table a unique, unique perspective here that I hopefully will make for an engaging conversation. Um, I think before I, we get into some of the questions, what we're going to talk about here, I want to define for our audience a little bit of what we're, the, the terms we're using here. And some may be familiar with the subject, some, some may not. I'm going to assume a lot of people maybe aren't familiar with it. But we're talking specifically about robotics and artificial intelligence and how it impacts uh, how it's impacting the workforce today and on into the future. But specifically when it comes to robotics, we're talking about the study of robots, that makes sense, right? <laughs> Which are machines, uh, especially one programmable by a computer, uh, capable of carrying out a complex series of actions automatically. Now I got that off of Wikipedia, right? Where mm -hmm. everybody gets information these days. Um, and one of the thing, one of, uh, as an example of that, when, uh, I found where researchers actually have this kind of applied robotics um, from the Harper's Adams University in England, uh, just this, uh, just a few months ago, managed to sow and harvest two and a half acres of barley using nothing but robots. You can actually go out there and watch it being done, and it's quite amazing, right, to see this combine and a tractor just working autonomously with each other. And um, <clears throat> so that's kind of an example of what we're talking about when we talk about this mm -hmm. idea of robotics. And um, now when it comes to artificial intelligence, uh, there's actually two different types that we're, t we're going to kind of focus on today. And the first is this artificial narrow intelligence, and that refers to a machine's ability to perform a single task extremely well and maybe even better than a human. So, I mean, there's just countless examples of that uh, today, right, where we can ask our, on our phones, you know, I can take out my phone, ask Siri or any other virtual assistant, you know, ask them about the weather, ask them about anything, and then a matter of seconds, they're able to tell you the answer, which uh, on my own would take me 
you know, <laughs> would take me an hour or a day or a week. Um, so that's narrow intelligence, but one of the things we'll also get into and probably what people think more of when they think of artificial intelligence is artificial general intelligence. And that's based on the principle um, where we could de develop this intelligence to the point at which it could simulate a human brain, right? So it would almost be, mm -hmm. uh, you wouldn't even know you're not talking to a human being and they'd have that ability to, to function at the human level. So that could be years off, it may be shorter, we'll talk about that. So. Uh, anyways, I just wanted to kind of clarify what we're talking about today, and, uh, but now I'm going to leave it up to you guys, and hopefully we'll have an interesting uh, conversation. Um, so uh, it does seem like we hear a lot about this in the, in the news, right? Um, podcasts, I mean, it seems like every time you, you go to the bookstore or whatever, you see something new about this subject. Um, is it overhyped? Is this, is it really as big of a deal as people make it out to be? Uh, coming from your respective fields, maybe Juan Pablo, do you wanna start mm -hmm. this off? Uh, is it overhyped? Yes, to some degree it is overhyped. Um, I think there are some significant changes that are occurring, not so much because we have new artificial intelligence methods, but because the infrastructure that enables artificial intelligence to, to happen is a lot better than it used to be. So we, it's a lot easier to capture a lot more data in, with high precision, and that's needed for machine learning, the machine learning that robots need, that uh, automated uh, cars that drive by themselves need. Um, we also have much more massive processing capabilities where we can have thousands, perhaps millions of computers working on a problem at the same time in parallel. We also have massive storage capabilities to so store information, continue processing, or access a lot of data very quickly, much more quickly than any human could do it. Uh, so some of those things are, are what's driving a lot of the changes that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. um, so there is some hype, especially on the, on the more generic AI, but I think we will see a lot of developments in the more narrow side of things because of these enabling factors that were not present before. And so, Brett, as a patent attorney, I mean, are you seeing more patents than maybe in prior decades or years that related to this idea of artificial intelligence, robotics? Certainly, and I think I would see a disproportionate number of those just because there aren't a lot of people that focus on that area, but I'm certainly seeing a lot of that. And it does kind of give me a perspective on what's coming down the road. Uh, I think part of the, the hype is the, the fear of the unknown and you know, news organizations might be able to leverage that to, to draw viewership. And you're not going to find any expert that's going to definitively come in and say, no, this is absolutely not going to happen because nobody knows. So I think it's overhyped to a certain to a certain extent, but also being in control and having ways to control AI is extremely important. I just don't think the, the hype meets the reality. Interesting. So um, it, this kind of gets to my next question, and it's closely related, but hopefully you'll see the distinction, and that is, if you, if you look back, I mean, the, the, the term was kind of first coined in the mid-50s, right? Mm -hmm. And if you read literature around that time, people were like, oh my gosh, in 10, 15, 20 years, we're going to be ruled by, you know, super intelligent machines. And well, obviously that what didn't happen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, it, and, and there's what they, call, what they call like AI winters, right? Where there's this rise in popularity and oh my gosh, it's the greatest thing ever. Everybody's going to lose their jobs. We're going to be, you know, designing killer robots. And then the reality <laughs> sets in and, you know, then for a decade, you don't really hear much about mm -hmm. it and it kind of goes dormant again. And it obviously seems like we're in the, uh, where it's fashionable again, it's a big deal. And I think you kind of already touched on, you know, why it is because mm -hmm. we have greater processing and, and whatnot. But I'm wondering, Rick, do you see from a labor perspective, I mean, are there signs like this is a bigger deal than it was in the past? And there is, I mean, mm -hmm. there, there's something we need to be concerned about here when it comes to, uh, you know, displacement of jobs or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I, I think that any time that, you know, when you get into anything that would potentially displace workers, um, that has a much larger effect than just displacing a worker. It has an effect on, immediate effect on, on local communities. It it's, uh, has an effect on our society. I think it's interesting that you bring up the 50s, that this was a booming time, you know, when, when, when they were talking about uh, robotics. And, mm -hmm. uh, because it reminds me of a story that I, I heard quite some time ago. Um, the United Auto Workers president at the time was touring a 
Ford factory. And in the 50s, uh, at that time, what they considered to be robots were yeah. starting to do a lot of that labor. And, and one of the management folks uh, asked the president of uh, UAW, United Auto, Auto Workers, um, you know, uh, Henry, uh, uh, how are you going to get these robots to pay union dues? And Henry, the president of uh, United yeah. Auto Workers, said, well, that's, that's, that's a good question, uh, but I have to ask you, how are you going to get these robots to buy cars? Right. So um, I do think that there's, um, uh, there is a concern. There's obviously concern when it comes to displacing workers, but I think that um, there are ways to reassure that workers are not being um, just totally displaced and, and replaced by uh, a machine. Mm -hmm. I think that the, there's other opportunities within the workplace that, that may be created by um, technology as well. Interesting. And I'm wondering, um, Brett, from your perspective, and we'll talk just, I, we'll go into talking about jobs and we're kind of bounce around mm -hmm. here a little bit, but um, do you have any thoughts when it comes to these patents and their, you know, correlation with producing jobs? I mean, do you feel like with what you are seeing from your perspective that um, as much as we're concerned about, oh, you know, all of our jobs are going to be automated away, is there a trend towards, no, that's not the case. Actually, the, the innovation, the patents you're seeing could in effect create more jobs or too many jobs. Right. Sense. I think there's different aspects. There's one of it where robots supplant people, and there's other ones like my area, law, where they augment people. So there's going to be a lot of things I'm not going to do that uh, a computer's going to do for me, which reduces cost, which increases demand. And then there's all new opportunities. Uh, Airbnb, I think, just came out with uh, uh, you can have experiences, and there's somebody that just takes people on hikes with their coyotes and makes $200,000 a year. So there's going to be brand new opportunities that were never there before. And it's a question of moving people from being supplanted to these new opportunities and finding out what those new opportunities are. Hmm. Juan Pablo, do you have any um, thoughts on, again, just from, from your perspective as a, as a computer scientist, mm -hmm. I mean, this, these emerging technologies, AI, robotics, I mean, what, are you, what is your opinion on the impact on, on jobs? I mean, do you feel like, uh, it's going to be a positive in the short term, in the long term, vice mm -hmm. versa. So I, I think it's mainly a political issue, not so much of a, of a technical issue. Uh, I think there, there are countries, there are systems that manage a little bit better than others uh, transitions when auto, automation takes over certain jobs. So a few years ago, for example, I visited the Lego factory in Billen, Denmark, and it's almost fully automated. Uh, the work that uh, about 60 some people used to do now only one person does it and robots do the rest at the same time if you if you know lego it's a very different company that it used to be say in this in the 70s where they just made just a few kinds of breaks with a few colors now they come up with new products all the time new shapes they have video games uh, they have movies with the lego characters uh, they do a lot more so there's been new jobs they're also in an environment in, in, in Denmark where there's low unemployment and there's very generous benefits to people who go in unemployment. They get retrained for, for jobs that are, that are needed. So uh, I think the whole system works well in that sense. And in, in, and in that case, at least with that example, it does not appear that there's, there's a negative. On the other hand, I could see the same technologies being applied in a different location where those safeguards are not in place and then the same technology having a negative impact. So I think it might depend on the, on the overall ecology around the jobs and, and what the political decisions are that, that have been made yeah. on, on what the impact is. So I'm just gonna throw this out to the group, anybody can snatch it. Uh, if I'm, let's say I'm in a, I'm a white collar, blue collar worker, right? And I'm, I'm starting to see, you know, some of this automation on the horizon for, for a variety of reasons. I'm reading books, I'm watching, you know, I'm seeing my, my jobs get automated away, I mean, for a lack of a better term. Um, what, what can I do, what can I do in that position? What's the best thing that I can do as a worker um, in that position, or anything? Is there anything, I can, is it out of my control? I mean, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, you should be looking at, if you're looking at an industry and you're worried that it might be taken over, go talk to people who've been in that industry for a while. I think they'd be more than happy to tell you pick a different job and they've probably been thinking about it. Here are some things to look into. Go talk to those employers and say, what skill sets do I need to do that to transition from what I'm doing now into this new skill set um, so I can be productive and there's going to be 
work for me down the road. I mean, I think in what, 18, 10, 84 percent of us were agriculture mm -hmm. and now 2 percent of us. So there are going to be jobs that are eliminated, but there's going to be more jobs that are going to be made. Um, so it's just a question of finding what those are. So pick what you want to do, find out from people who are in that industry where you need to be in the next 10, 15 years. Yeah. And Rick, we were talking earlier, um, you know, obviously autom automation is not something new. I mean, uh, arguably it's been around for a couple hundred years. I mean, dating back mm -hmm. to the beginning of the industrial age, right? So we're just kind of in this, we're using different terms. We're seeing it impacting in different ways, but essentially it's the same old story. But uh, I mean, do you have any thoughts on how does a worker transition from one field to the other. I mean, you know, they're a plumber for 40 years or they're, uh, you know, at a particular, when 40 years, maybe to say 20 years, or they're working for a corporation and have been for 20 years and they have a re really unique skill set, they can't find it because it's been automated away. What is your, what are your thoughts on that as far as what, what, what is your advice for a young worker or somebody in the middle of their career? <laughs> well, um, Again, uh, do your homework, do your research, and I think uh, um, Juan Pablo is hitting it, uh, the nail on the head when he says that this this is, is, is actually really a, a, maybe perhaps a political issue, where you have countries such as Denmark that are that are making sure that they have safeguards uh, for their workforce, where perhaps um, the concentration of wealth in countries such as Denmark is not quite what it is in the United States, so therefore they. Maybe a very large corporation doesn't have necessarily the the political power mm -hmm. um, to uh, um, just uh, disregard workers and, and go completely automated. Um, but I, I you know I don't think anybody has the the, the magic answer to um, someone who is potentially going to be displaced right. for any reason. Yeah. Um, uh, so what I'm hearing is maybe this is, in some respects, the responsibility of either local, state, or federal, of the federal government in some ways. So let me ask you that. And again, anybody that feels like they can add, add to this uh, question here. Um, so what can our, our local governments or state governments, uh, federal and whatnot, what can they do or what should they do to help prepare our workforce for what some see as a tsunami of of automation that's uh, you know, that's coming. Anybody have any thoughts on that? I think you know, it, it, as with any kind of technology, the law moves so much more slowly than the technology. The technology is going to be so much further past lawmakers. And I certainly appreciate that this isn't fair, but jobs like lawyers are probably not going to be supplanted because most of the lawyers are making the, the rules, and so they're going to make the rules in such a way that yeah. that's they're not going to eliminate their own jobs. Um, for uh, truckers, you know, people who drive for a living, that's going to be something that I think needs to be addressed right away because I think a lot of those jobs are going to be uh, taken over uh, next uh, five or ten years. And by m telling lawmakers that there's going to be this huge problem unless they take care of it now, if they take care of it early on, it's very easy to do. I mean, you can you can do it in baby steps, but if you wait till it's this tsunami. Um, you're just going to be, you know, digging out a, a hole that uh, you're never going to get out of. Yeah, and, and that is a good point, right? I mean, it's re this, this technology is just rapidly progressing that it's almost nearly impossible to predict, you know, what segment of the job market is going to impact and then, you know, government's having to react. So I think there's almost kind of that invisible hand that's guiding this, you know, the free market that we all have to kind of be vigilant of. and. Um, and and kind of keep sharp when it comes to you know con constantly developing our skills. And so I'm wondering, Juan Pablo, from a educational perspective, mm -hmm. um, what are universities, colleges, I mean, what are they doing to kind of prepare uh, you know, uh, prepare the younger generation? So at the university level, are we doing anything with? to prepare everyone for automation. I'm not sure that we are doing <laughs> anything in particular to prepare for automation other than uh, providing people a well-rounded education so they can actually not just be, have a narrow set of skills that, uh, that is not flexible and enables them to move to, to another uh, area. So I would say that's the best we can do is to provide a, uh, a well-rounded education. Yeah, the reason I ask is um, I was re in researching for this uh, show um, th there was an example given how in the late 60s, how gas uh, station attendants, roughly mm -hmm. 150,000 of them, uh, 
uh, in just a matter of a few years, were completely replaced by the, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the automated gas machine <laughs> dispenser, whatever you call it. Um, and how that, along with a few other factors, really kind of pushed, you know, for parents, it was like, oh my gosh, this is the writing's on the wall, you know, we're going to, these kind of uh, low paying, if you will, or even entry level positions or jobs that just don't require much education, they're going to mm -hmm. go away rapidly, right? So that caused a lot of people to encourage their kids to go to college. And, you know, you sure. saw uh, participation rates of, as far as kids going to college in the 80s and 90s just skyrocket from what they were then. So in some sense, you know, they, they saw that, you know, the importance of a higher education um, and becoming highly, more highly skilled. So I'm wondering, does anybody have any thoughts on the types of jobs that are going to be out there in the future? Do we need mm -hmm. to... Is it just going to be manual labor type jobs that machines can't do? Is it going to be very highly skilled technical fields like, like a lawyer or a scientist or what? I would say that when, um, when I think of some of the things that make us very human, I typically think of three things. It's uh, our creativity, so being any job that involves being creative. Uh, also connecting with other people and with the, with the physical space around us. I think that's something that's easier for humans to do than for, for machines. And that, that requires a wide range of communication with other people, not just, say, not just speech or text, but really uh, being able to, uh, I don't know, look at someone a certain way or, or, uh, or pat someone on the shoulder <laughs> at the right time, right? So those are the types of, of things that I think are, will be harder to replace. Now, a lot of those are not necessarily about education, I would say mm -hmm. on the creative side, definitely education plays, plays a role, the way we communicate as well. So Certainly, yeah, anything that's interactive, like you said, the entertainment industry is going to be you know, big because that's not something that you can replace. Uh, anything in the medical field where you have to deal one-on-one -on -one with people, I think that's going to be big. And like I said before, I keep using this example, the Airbnb, uh, they have, you can go learn how to be a burlesque person, you can go uh, do the hikes with the wolves, you can um, work with a, a comedy writer. You can have go to somebody's apartment and listen to a stand-up comedian. So these experiences, these things that computers will never be able to do because it's an emotional, relational situation, those are the jobs that are not going to be replaced. But Famous not last words. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, they can do some amazing things. I, um, but, I, you know, I think the moral of the story is focus on jobs that it's difficult for computers to do, right? You know, I, you know, I bet that's without a crystal ball, I mean, that's about the best right. you can do, right? Mm -hmm. And so to your point, yeah, if facing where you're interacting with people and so that's good. Um, all right, so I wanted to just uh, kind of a high level speculative type um, question here, but um, interesting quote by Vladimir Putin. Uh, he said recently, uh, whoever becomes the leader in this sphere, artist, referring to artificial intelligence, will become ruler of the world. AI is the future, not only for Russia, but for all humankind. It comes with colossal opportunities, but also threats that are difficult to predict. So what it, my question around that is, is this in some sense a zero-sum game? Either it's going to just be the greatest thing that happened in the world, or it's it's going to be the worst thing ever. I mean, what, what, are you, what is your thoughts when it comes to the future of what this technology could bring? And it could be from any, any perspective, uh, jobs, education. Um. I think uh, Russia is getting kind of scared because I think China and the U.S. are really in the race. And as soon as AlphaGo beat the world, chess, uh, the yeah. world uh, uh, Go champion, China really got on board and said, we're just going to dump just an incredible amount of resources. So I think they have the people and the resources uh, that we don't have, but I think we uh, have the data that they don't have. So it's a race between the two. And I think what Russia's trying to do is, is scare us into the idea that it has to be collaborative, because I think it boils down to it does have to be collaborative. If any of those two entities collaborated, they're going to be so much better than even who the leader is that you kind of have to collaborate to make it work would be my perspective yeah. on that. And this is interesting. Before the show, Juan Pablo, we were talking mm -hmm. about um, <clears throat> this idea of, you know, in the future as this a AI technology progresses and the danger is that you will have, you know, you'll have one or two or three companies with all of the data, to your point, and with all of the information and, you know, with information comes power. And, um, and so 
is there a legitimate concern there? And if there is, how do we kind of mitigate for that kind of worst case scenario in which you have either one government, rogue government with all this information and power or, or a corporation? I mean, is there, is there ways in which we can kind of prepare for these worst case scenarios? Um, so, so I think it is a concern. It's a valid concern because you could have um, a few individuals with a lot of power, uh, say everyone who can reroute cars, a third of the cars in the US at their will. And that's a lot of power, right? Uh, and that's, that's a simple, small example. There could be worse things. Uh, and you could have the power to do that in, in the number of, with, uh, in the hands of very few people with little accountability. That's a danger. Uh, I think uh, the solutions are likely legal or political again, and, and, and they're about adapting to what happens and, and our ability to adapt. Uh, I think some of it might have to do with who gets to own information about what we do. Uh, and that may be more of a, on, the, on the legal side. Right, and unfortunately it's not an altruistic thing. It's, yeah. it's a political rent sinking where the people in power pay the politicians to you know, draft the legislation in such a way that, that they get a disproportionate amount of the resources through regulation. And so we need to address that yeah. uh, you know, as soon as we can, otherwise we're gonna run into the problems that you spoke of, a few people having all the power. Yeah. And so regulation is important, right? And, and government mm -hmm. oversight. And I, I, wouldn't, I would not want anyone to ever quote me on uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, I think it's I going do, to, yeah. you know, whether that regulation is political yeah. or whether it's in the computer, you know, uh, industry itself, uh, having AI control because you have a problem with AI, yeah. and AI is not going to take over the world, but it would do stupid things that you wouldn't think. Like if you have, you said, hey, figure out the Riemann hypothesis, and this computer just, takes over the world and, re and recruits every living person to solve this hypothesis because it doesn't understand, do it within reason. Um, so we have to control the people controlling computers and we have to control the computers themselves. Yeah. And I think adding transparency to decisions yep. and suggestions that AI makes, I think, can be important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we don't have a lot of time left here on the show, but I did want to get back to this idea again of how this impacts, could impact our, our uh, work, you know, our work life. So with just two minutes left, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on just purely speculative, let's say 30, 40 years from now, if AI continues to progress as it is, what is different about our, our work life? Any thoughts? Well, I, I, you know, I don't know if you want to take it to the nth degree and say, okay, well, AI is going to take over and you're going to have every truck out there and every train out there and every, um, you know, form of distribution of product throughout the, the country or the world is going to, now going to be uh, no human factor to it, I think is, that's unimaginable to me because we live in a society where uh, a country, uh, where we, we, we still don't have um, equality in pay. Um, there's, we still don't have... Um, the opportunity for for kids to to get the education they want. I mean, we're so far off on so many social issues. At least in, in my opinion, and in, in organized labor's view, um, I can't imagine that we're going to make that leap and go from here to there. Yeah, um, there would be public outcry. It would. I just I can't see. Yeah, that. and I think most people would would say that it wouldn't be an overnight thing, right? But it could be d a decades long if, if progression have, to where we are. If you have folks that uh, if we become a society where where uh, you know a majority of folks are, are not working, um, there's there's uh, who's going to fund them? Because now you're talking about getting into the realm of having the government um, uh, pay people to not do anything, mm -hmm. and I, I can't. I don't. Think yeah. we're there. I well, don't think we're there yet. Yeah, so, no, which is a whole other, <laughs> yeah, whole other, a whole uh, other show. show so, that's show, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I mean, we've covered a lot of interesting stuff, yeah. and certainly we could talk forever about this subject. And um, I guess time will tell what the impact is. So uh, again, thank you for joining us this morning. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation here. And again, if you'd like to know more about it, I recommend this book, Life 3.0: Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. Fascinating read. I hope you'll join us again next week. Thank you, and have a great day.